Today I want to talk about reading, why reading is important as a part of our language learning strategy and how we can enjoy reading at different stages in our language learning journey. So I was sitting at the doctor's office this morning, actually it wasn't a doctor's office, it was a a lab, I had to have a blood test done, I'm waiting for 25 minutes so I can read on my iPhone. I'm reading Arabic, I can look up words, all kinds of functionality, I can hear the words, all great. And yet, for me, my goal and my sort of greatest milestone in working towards acquiring a language is getting to the point where I can read a paper book, a full paper book, away from computer, away from all of the, the types of help that are available to us on digital formats. So, how do we get there? I'm going to be talking about history to some extent. I'm going to be talking about some scientific studies about how the brain reads. And I will leave the links in the description box rather than going into a lot of detail about these links and the names of the people who did the studies and so forth and so on. Human beings have not been reading for very long in terms of their history as, as human beings. The earliest writing systems, from what I gather from my reading, were the systems developed in Sumer, in what is today Iraq, the either cuneiform or cuneiform writing systems. They in turn influenced the Egyptians who developed their hieroglyphic writing system. And that's going back three, 4,000 years ago. And then there was even a writing system in Crete, which has yet to be deciphered, called the Minoan uh, writing system. And uh, then the Chinese and the Phoenicians, I think roughly around the same time, developed uh, writing systems quite independently of each other. The assumption is that the Phoenician system was influenced by the Sumerian system, and it in turn influenced uh, the writing systems that most of the world use today, the Latin alphabet, the Greek alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, and of course, the Arabic script. So writing hasn't been with us for a long time. So the brain didn't evolve some kind of very efficient way of getting right into reading and converting sort of written lines on a page into meaning. And therefore, the way we process reading is very much connected to the way we process sound. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see that there's sort of like a portion of our brain, which is apparently where we recognize faces and images. And that's where the word comes in as an image. And then it connects up to the area where we process sound. And then through sound, it goes into meaning and all of the other things that we need in order to decipher what is written on the page. So reading and listening are very closely related. People who read well also understand the spoken word better. They have a larger vocabulary. They hear the words more clearly, apparently. And I also find that if I'm acquiring vocabulary, if I can't see the word, it's very difficult for me to remember it. Once I've seen the word a few times, I have that image of the word. And then when I hear the word, I seem to remember the meaning more clearly. So close connection between listening and reading. And that's important as I continue to explain how we as language learners can use both listening and even more important reading as part of our uh, language learning strategy. It's interesting in that regard that the form of the writing system influences how the brain processes it. So the Chinese characters, for example, which are like clumps of meaning, and even hangul, which is clumps of sound, they are processed in the brain in a similar way. Whereas the purely sort of letter by letter phonetic script are processed differently. So there is a relationship between the type of writing system and how the brain deals with it. Although the general path is what I described earlier. Now, the important thing about reading is, for most of history, most human beings didn't read. Obviously, we have the development of, of paper and of printing and technology that makes it easier to sort of distribute written material and therefore makes reading accessible to more and more people. Still, probably no more than 10% of people in the world could read even up to a couple of hundred years ago. And it's only now, or recently, relatively recently, that we've got this world where you know, over 90% of people can read. That's relatively new. And reading changes our brains for the better. It helps to create stronger connections between different parts of the brain. It increases the white matter in the brain, which is that sheathing which facilitates communication within the brain. Now, some people who have dyslexia, those developments in the brain are not always there in to the same degree. 
However, forcing ourselves to read can create improvements in that regard in the brain. So using different technologies and different therapies, if we can uh, somehow help people read, that's going to help them strengthen these connections in their brains. Studies have shown that beyond that, reading is relaxing. Reading increases empathy. It obviously increases the number of words we know. Typically, the written word has more low frequency words than we're likely to hear in speech. It's even suggested that it can prolong our lives because of all of these beneficial things that derive from reading. And of course, we acquire lots of knowledge through reading and we even acquire language through reading. Now, some of you are going to say, well, how do I get to reading a language where I don't know the words? And I will get to that. But first, I want to touch on another subject, and that is reading on paper versus reading on a digital device. And part of getting to where you can read a book on paper, which I said at the outset was my goal in language learning, part of that is to be able to quickly access the meaning of words, and in some cases where the writing system is not familiar to us or not, that's called transparent, one-to-one, -one, then also the ability to hear the word. So we can use digital reading to access text that would otherwise be too difficult for us. We can look up words, we can hear the word, we can isolate a sentence as we do at Link, we can listen to the sentence, we can look up words and then review those words. So there's many different ways that we can use digital devices as a sort of a, a, a gateway towards eventually being able to read on paper, which to me is kind of the holy grail. However, then the subject comes up, should we continue reading on our iPhones, iPads, computer screens, or should we read a book on paper? Uh, also Kindle, for example, which is digital reading. And apparently there's a lot of research that shows that it is more beneficial for us. We retain the information better. There are greater benefits to our brain from reading on paper than from reading on a screen. And there are a number of reasons for this. One, there is that sort of tactile experience of holding a book, of being able to move your finger along the paper, of turning the page, even the thickness of the page. All of these things apparently are relaxing, are beneficial, and help us remember. And they have done studies. For example, there was a study out of Norway. You'll find the link in the description box, which demonstrated that the retention of information was better with paper books as opposed to reading on a digital device. In fact, there have been other studies, one done in the year 2000 and one done in the year 2017, that indicates that reading on a digital device tends to create a more superficial or shallow approach to reading. We're not as focused. We're attracted or distracted by other things. And we start reading in a more shallow manner. And this tends to influence how we read on paper. So there are some negatives to the sort of digital reading, even though it is a very good way to get to the point where you can read a paper book. And certainly in my own experience, I always invest a lot of time with my digital reading before I then pick up a paper book. So technology is changing how we access books or information that is contained in books. One of the major changes over the last perhaps 10, 20 years is the emergence of podcasting, MP3 files, audiobooks, and things of that nature. The average person in the United States, older than the age of 13, spends an hour and 40 minutes a day listening to some form of audio. 75% of people over 18 in the U.S., listen to some form of audio every month. And it's become a dominant way for us to consume information. And the reasons given are that it's possible to do it while doing other things, primarily in the home. And I'm an example of this. I listen while cleaning up around the house or doing other things or exercising. I listen in my car. And all of that has become so easy to do now. I'm in my car with Apple CarPlay. I can listen to my favorite podcasts. If I'm, my interest is tweaked, then I can go back in there and get the transcript. And that's another thing that's happening with the advent of AI. The sort of lines between audio and, and text are starting to be blurred because my Apple podcast now is available as a transcript immediately in certain languages, not in all languages. For my Arabic, 
Of course, I can use Whisper AI, which we have connected with Link, and any podcast that I'm listening to, I can just, if I can get a hold of the MP3 file, I pull it in, I have a transcript of that lesson, which I can use then to try to, you know, learn the words that I wasn't able to understand while listening to the podcast. So there's a, a tremendous availability of, of audio. It's very popular with people. It now connects to text so we can read it uh, whenever we want and use that as an opportunity to learn the words that we need to learn. Now, let's get back to this idea of enjoying our reading. So we can use audio. Uh, we can use the connection between audio and text. We can use the ability to look words up online in digital text. Uh, different apps that help us review what we're listening to and the words in there that we need to learn. We can use all of that to improve our ability to read independently. And the goal, as I've said before, is to read away from the computer in a more relaxed way on paper where we can actually heft that book and turn the page. Now, in order to enjoy that experience, what I have found in, in my own experience, it's easier to read nonfiction. So in the different languages that I have learned, I start reading a nonfiction book first. The likelihood is that I'm familiar with, or at least interested in, the subject matter of that nonfiction book. Once I'm into a story, once I'm into literature, I'm no longer familiar with the context. It's culturally different. There are a lot of words there that are more literary that I don't know. So that is at a later stage. I might also add that a lot of the literature that I have read in different languages, these have tended to consist in rather thick books. And to me, it's perfectly all right to read uh, and also listen to, but then read so Anna Karenina or War and Peace in Russian or I Promessi Sposi. You'll excuse me for being a fan of 19th century literature, but not to read the whole thing. In other words, it can be an enjoyable experience to read a few chapters from those books and have that sense of sort of, look at me, the training wheels are off. I'm reading on paper. I'm reading literature. I'm in that world of Italy of the 17th century, uh, but I don't understand everything. And this brings me to another point. Very often in, in language class and in, even in, in reading class, the teachers seem to want the learner to understand everything and to prove that the learner understood everything. And the teacher wants to impose reading strategies and ask comprehension questions. And all of this destroys the enjoyment of reading. To me, reading should be enjoyable. Uh, even if there are large parts that you don't understand, the fact that it is washing over your brain, is going through those pathways, uh, the visual uh, entry point through the phonological or sound processing area of the brain, it's bringing all of that into our brains and improving our ability to process that language. Any sort of la <laughs> reading strategies that teachers love to foist on kids basically relate to the level of our knowledge about the subject at hand. And the teachers recognize this. The prior knowledge, as they call it, is fundamental to comprehension. Not inferring the ability to infer, the ability to analyze, the ability to rehash. None of that matters. What matters is our familiarity with the subject. And if our familiarity is less than perfect, but we still enjoy processing it, we are acquiring some background knowledge. The background knowledge as we acquire it doesn't have to be 100%. Uh, it can still be enjoyable. And I think it's important to have that as a goal, to be able to process some of the language, maybe go back over the same material again later, but enjoy the fact that we're able to read. And in that regard, one of the things that you often hear people say is that we need to know 90% or 95% or more of the vocabulary in a text in order to enjoy it or in order to understand it. And I would say to that, I don't have to understand it all. Uh, I can build myself up using digital means in a text that has 20% unknown words if I'm interested enough. So there are no hard and fast rules in my mind as to how many known words you need to have in order to understand or appreciate that text because I can appreciate texts where there are gaps. Ultimately, I would like to go back in and fill in the gaps using, you know, digital means where I can look up words. But once I've sat myself down with a book on paper and I'm holding on to it and I'm in the 17th century Italy, I just want to enjoy that experience and I don't care 
about stuff that tends to fly by me, as long as there's not too much of it, of course. It's all a, a function of degree. So to summarize, you know, reading, reading on paper as an ultimate goal, reading using digital devices as an ability to increase our capability, our vocabulary, our familiarity, using audio to enhance our reading because audio and, and reading are, you know, intimately connected. These are all parts of using reading as a fundamental strategy in language acquisition. And everyone has to find their own way, but the goal should be to enjoy it at every stage, to enjoy it. I once referred to this sort of upside down hockey stick, how in an initial period, it's tough sledding, you know, it's hard going up that steep hill. We don't know the language at all, hard to get traction, but finally we get to sort of a level of some familiarity with the language. But then we have that very, very long path, very, very long path where we have to acquire so many low frequency words. It's difficult at first. And as we acquire more and more words, we're chasing lesser and lesser frequency words. However, the amount that we understand, the amount that is clear to us is increasing all the time. It seems like we're not getting anywhere, but in fact we are, and we're better and better able to enjoy the language. And ultimately, even with some missing words, we can grab that book, sit down in our you know favorite sofa or, or a chair, and read that book on paper, enjoy it, and get all of the benefits of reading on paper. So... There you have it. Thank you for listening. And I have talked about this subject in the past, and I'll leave you with a couple of related videos. Thank you.